you. Good afternoon, everyone. We apologize for the technical difficulties, but it looks like we all have everyone uh, here together now. The uh, time is 4.26 p.m. on June 2nd, 2021, and on behalf of the State Evaluation Appeals Panel, I will call our meeting to order. The first item um, that we need to do is a roll call. We have three uh, state board members appointed by the state board. Ms. Holly Bloodworth. Uh, Dr. Sharon Porter Robinson. Yes, I'm present. Lee Todd. I'm present. Everyone is present. The next item of business for the seat is to nominate um, and elect a chair to run the meeting. So we will open the floor for nominations for a chair. I uh, nominate Holly Woodworth for chair of this committee. Dr. Todd is uh, nominated Ms. Bloodworth. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, the matter before the panel then is to vote on the election of uh, Holly Bloodworth as chair of the State Evaluation of Meals panel. Uh, we can do a roll call vote. First is Ms. Bloodworth. Yes. Dr. Sharon Porter Robinson. Yes. Dr. Todd. Yes. Ms. Bloodworth, yeah. Well, my name is Holly Bloodworth, and I'll be chairing this appeals panel. With me today are Lee Todd and Sharon Robinson. This appeal will be considered today under KRS 156.557 and 704-KAR3-370. The panel does not have any jurisdiction relative to the complaint involving the professional judgmental conclusion of the evaluation and the jurisdiction is limited to procedural matters already addressed by the local appeals panel as required by KRS 156.557. We have allotted one hour for this appeal. Within this hour, each side will be given an opportunity to make a 15-minute oral presentation. We will begin with the teacher's representative. The teacher's representative may reserve time for rebuttal. After both sides have made their presentations and the teacher's representative made her rebuttal presentation, if any, the seat panel may ask questions. Thereafter, we will go into closed session to deliberate. All right, so now introduction of the parties and our party representatives. So, who? We'll begin with uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, representative, and okay. then on to the district. If you all will introduce yourself, everyone who's on the call for the record, please. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Marilyn Shrewsbury. I'm here today with Dr. Johnson and on her behalf. And yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is Tyson Gorman here on behalf of the Jefferson County Board of Education. I have with me Mariana Michael, uh, who is an associate in our office who has assisted on this matter. And then I have Tanika Moore, who is uh, an employee relations consultant with the district as well. All right, is that everyone? All right, so the next thing is we have our teacher representative will present. So, Counsel for Dr. Johnson may proceed. Do you want to reserve time for rebuttal? Yes, um, if it would please the panel, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. All right, thank you. Again, good afternoon. As I introduced myself to you earlier, my name is Marilyn Shrewsbury. I, I'm here today with my client, Dr. Kimberly Johnson, um, who was formerly a counselor employed by Jefferson County Public School District. Um, we are here today to discuss whether or not the Jefferson County Public School District failed to implement the evaluation plan as approved by the state, uh, which is at issue today uh, in relation specifically to her May 12th, 2020 interim summative evaluation. The panel has received presumably a brief from myself on behalf of Dr. Johnson and 
more paper than they probably wanted to receive to review to include the Jefferson County Public School Certified Personnel Evaluation Plan, which is the plan that we'll be discussing today. As it relates to Dr. Johnson's evaluation, uh, it specifically will be referencing pages 29 through pages 36 of, or rather 38 of the evaluation plan. And for brevity, I'll be referring to it as the JCPS CPEP. First, it's important to note the timeline of this appeals history. Dr. Johnson received the evaluation at issue on May 12, 2020. She appealed uh, per the guidelines by May 22, 2020. She did not receive a decision on her appeal from the district evaluation appeals panel for a period of 200 days, uh, approximately January 8, 2021. In that appeal, Dr. Johnson specifically appealed the issues related to the all information that was included and related to her professional growth plan as it was not ever fully developed nor mentioned within the time frame, 30 days, allotted by the JCPS CPEP and also KAR 704-3370. Dr. Johnson additionally appealed all unsupported statements contained within the evaluation. And in our brief, we go into detail on those unsupported statements. After she received the final decision from the District Evaluation Appeals Panel, they found that the PGP, or rather the mention of the PGP, the Professional Growth Plan, should be removed from her evaluation as they found it was not completed within the 30 days allotted by the district and the state. One of our main issues is that in removing mention of the PGP, they should have also removed any and all evaluation information that related to underlying uh, to the PGP as an underlying measurement tool for the evaluation itself. So the PGP being the basis of measurement on the four domains of the Kentucky Framework for School Guidance Counselors, including planning and preparation, environment, delivery of service, and professional responsibilities. If the PGP wasn't done within 30 days, then it stands that the rest of the information included in the evaluation also does not stand unless it's tied to something outside what would be included in the PGP. The violations of policy and regulation related to this interim summative evaluation not only included the PGP, but also included participation in conference to review the evaluation system itself within the first 30 calendar days of reporting for employment. That did not occur within the first 30 calendar days reporting for employment each year, all counselors will complete a self-reflection. That did not occur. By October 1st, each counselor will develop a student learning focus statement. That did not occur. All observation site visits are to be conducted openly and with full knowledge of the counselor pursuant to both state regulation and of course the JCPS CPEP page 31. As our brief indicates, Dr. Johnson was purportedly observed, which the outcome of that observation was mentioned in her evaluation uh, on the very last day of in-person learning while she was working in the cafeteria pursuant to her 
job duties, roles, and functions, that is outside the bounds of the um, policy and procedure, which says you have to know about the observation that's going to occur. Additionally, a post-observation site visit conference is to be held within five working days of the observation. Um, the lack of appropriate documentation that goes with that post uh, observation is important because in Dr. Johnson's case, as the facts in our brief detail, after her initial observation for the 2019-2020 school year, she was brought in for an observation and her supervisor, the principal, did not put her uh, conference um, notes related to the observation in the appropriate on the appropriate paperwork as prescribed by the policy implemented by JCPS and adopted by the state. Uh, school counselors, they're allowed to have the opportunity to re to receive a peer observation site visit in their summative years. Dr. Johnson was given the opportunity to have a peer come and observe her. However, it's essential to the peer observation process that within 15 days after that observation, she's to have an additional observation with her supervisor, in this case, the school principal, so that the school principal can see what the peer saw. And in this case, of course, that did not happen. And then again, you know, as we're sitting here today, and as mentioned earlier, the timeline for the appeals process itself, the DEEP, the district evaluation appeals panel should have rendered a written decision within 30 days of May 22nd, 2020. It wasn't until December 29th of 2020 that a decision was reached, which is over 200 days after the appeal. And Dr. Johnson received this written decision only on January 8th, 2021. So while we understand being here today that it is the SEEP's position that their jurisdiction is over process and procedure, the implementation of the JCPS CPEP did not occur as it relates to Dr. Johnson's May 12, 2020 interim summative evaluation. Process was ignored and she was failed in the process of receiving a legitimate evaluation based on her entitlement as a counselor within the Jefferson County Public School District and Kentucky State Education system. Um, ultimately, again, all of these violations that I've outlined are briefed in detail in our written statement. And the lack of the PGP, the fact that the DEEP removed the PGP from Dr. Johnson's interim summative evaluation did not take care of the remaining issues that were present. All of the facts that were included, um, you may hear that they were professional judgments made. Well, those professional judgments from her supervisor had to come from somewhere. Where did she get those judgments? Was it by virtue of observation? Because there's a process for observation. If she failed to follow the process for the observation, then whatever it is that she has to say via that observation is now not relevant to this document because she didn't have that post-conference visit. Is it based on a peer observation? Well, again, essential to peer observation is a follow-up observation from your supervisor. Is it based on a self-reflection, a, a, a basis of measurement for a employee at the school to know what their job duties and responsibilities are, know what they intend on working toward and growing toward throughout the course of the school year, 
so that they have some basis for measurement and growth. If that doesn't exist, how are you evaluating them on a rubric that they are unaware of? How is it fair to offer an evaluation on that when the regulations say that it isn't? Um, additionally, the appeals process is in place for a reason. I guarantee that if Dr. Johnson had failed to meet the requirements under the statutes and the JCPS CPEP for appealing this evaluation within the time frame she was allotted, her appeal would have been summarily dismissed. So why is it that the district evaluations appeals panel gets an additional 200 days to do what was supposed to be done within 30 days? Ultimately speaking, we think that the entirety of the evaluation should be thrown out as summarily it was written completely out of the bounds set forth and the requirements set forth in 704KR3370 as it relates to KRS 156 and the JCPS CPEP as adopted by the state. Thank you. The school district representative present. So council for the district may proceed. Thank you. Can, um, Madam Chairwoman, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to make some preliminary points and then I'll turn to some of the more specific items that Ms. Shrewsbury mentioned. Uh, one of the things I want to mention off the top is that um, this is somewhat an odd procedure in the sense that it, it basically serves as an appeal, uh, but we have a situation where both parties submit their briefs at the same time versus the uh, the appelling, uh, the group making the appeal, filing first, and then the defendant responding. Uh, one of the items that that results in is that both sides sort of guess at what the other side's going to argue. Um, we did a little bit of that here. One thing that is not in our brief that we definitely need to address is that the jurisdiction of this panel, as indicated in, I believe, the, the, the um, opening remarks that the chairman made, as well as in the, the February 8th, 2021 letter from uh, Todd Allen to the parties indicating how this procedure will work, is that uh, this is an appeal of items, quote, already addressed by the local appeals panel. Um, I think if you go back and look, you will, he you will see that a number of the issues that were just raised uh, by Ms. Shrewsbury on behalf of Dr. Johnson were never addressed by the, the panel below, the, uh, either the deep or the leap. And I want to be clear that, that those, two, uh, those two terms are interchangeable. Uh, local evaluation appeals panel, uh, Jefferson County, for reasons that I'm unfamiliar with, actually changed the name of their local evaluations panel to the district evaluations panel. Uh, but those are one and the same, just so we're clear. Uh, but I do think we have a situation here where we're basically on appeal and we're, we're talking about some items that I would guess, for lack of a better term, were not properly preserved below uh, because they were not addressed below. Many of these again, arguments, again, that were set forth in, Ms. in Dr. Johnson's brief uh, were not addressed by the local evaluation appeals panel, and that is improper uh, pursuant to the rules of this body, which indicate that only matters brought below should be addressed. Um, the other comment, other general comments I will make, um, you know, this is a situation to the extent I understand the appeal, it appears to be largely an appeal that objects to the tone and tenor of this evaluation. And uh, as was indicated, that is not a proper uh, appeal to this body. Uh, as the chairperson indicated at the beginning of this procedure, uh, this panel, and I quote, does not have jurisdiction relative to complaints involving the professional judgments, conclusions of evaluations, end quote. Uh, I believe that's exactly uh, the effort that is being made here. Uh, there is a suggestion essentially that the evaluation is somehow too negative, uh, that the, the comments offered therein uh, um, are, are too harsh, are too critical. 
Um, there is very little indication that uh, there's a suggestion of a breakdown in, in procedure specific to what was actually discussed again at the leap below versus what is being offered now. Um, I would also like to say, coupling with that, um, there is an alternative procedure to this procedure to address tone and tenor um, objections to an evaluation. Uh, as this panel is likely well aware, um, the procedure for evaluations allows for um, a person receiving an evaluation to prepare a rebuttal. Uh, they have free reign to basically include whatever they wish within that rebuttal, and to the extent they feel like the tone and tenor of an evaluation is inappropriate, uh, they have an opportunity to, quote, set the record straight, if you will. Um, Ms. Dr. Johnson had that opportunity and for whatever reason did not avail herself of it. Uh, the evaluation itself, uh, the tail end of it, uh, specifies her right to do that. And I would suggest that that was the mechanism that should have been used here to, to raise or lodge the objections that, uh, that are being offered here. Um, I would also encourage this panel to spend some time actually reading the evaluation. That seems, I guess, on somewhat uh, a little bit silly, but, uh, but I do think it's important because I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it brings forth the fact that this is an interim summative evaluation. This is not uh, the longer form detailed evaluation. A decision was made because of COVID by the principal, uh, Principal Kimbrough. Uh, she made a decision not to do the full blown summative evaluation for some of the reasons that frankly, Ms. Shrewsbury outlined in terms of an ability to observe uh, and see Dr. Johnson in action, uh, that opportunity was admittedly cut short because of COVID. And so a decision was made to use the short firm, not the long form. And as you will see in using the short firm, there really is no grading that goes on here. Uh, unlike the long form that has different um, domains in which uh, uh, there's a ranking, if you will, or a grading across the domains, uh, you don't have that in this interim summative. Uh, there, there's no grading of any sort. Uh, it is simply a, essentially a, a recitation of accomplishments uh, made by Dr. Johnson and then items for Dr. Johnson to work on in the future. And that's all it is. Um, and frankly, if you do spend some time reading the evaluation, you will see that most of the listing of accomplishments uh, is as long, if not longer, than the items that Dr. Johnson objects to as being negative. Um, and again, I would suggest that really what this is about is a suggestion that the tone and tenor of those items to work on uh, is somehow inappropriate or too harsh, which again is not an appropriate use of this particular mechanism. Um, I want to speak first specifically to this issue that there was not an appropriate um, um, observation below. Um, there's a couple of points in the briefing about that, but just to be clear, um, there was one early observation uh, that Principal Kimbrough did not properly document, and so she did not use it for this interim summative evaluation. There's only one observation listed on the evaluation. If Again, if you spend some time looking at it, uh, that one was appropriately handled. There's an objection to one that, again, preceded it that again was not used because Principal Kimbrough understood that she did not properly document it. And then there is this discussion of the effort that was made on the last day of school, that Friday the 13th, when uh, unfortunately the world came crashing down for so many of us and, and, and the, the, the wheels came to a grinding halt as, uh, as COVID laid in and school let out and no one really knew what the future held. And as Dr. Kim, as, as Principal Kimbrough indicated in a document that's a part of Exhibit D to our submission, um, she reflected on it a, month, a few months after the fact and, and wrote a short narrative about what went on there. She did contemplate trying to get done an observation that day so that she could move forward with a full-blown summative evaluation. She quickly realized that was not going to happen and she abandoned that plan. And so there is no observation from that date. The summative evaluation makes no mention of an observation from that date. And again, the form of this evaluation is an interim. She did not elect to do the full blown 
uh, observation, a full-blown summative evaluation, which would have required that observation, which again, she simply didn't have time to do for, through no fault of anyone uh, at all, simply through COVID. Uh, I would also point to COVID as largely the reason for the other delays that are being discussed. I would point out that those delays, there's no evidence that those delays were raised below uh, to the LEAP. Um, any suggestion at all that their work was not being handled timely. I uh, don't believe, therefore, that those objections are, are preserved for resolution here. But again, even if they were, what we are talking about is a delay over the summertime uh, while COVID was happening. And also the, another issue that you will see if you look through the briefing uh, and some of the attachments to the briefing, uh, we had a situation where um, Dr. Johnson has, uh, has a pending lawsuit against the district. She also had a former lawsuit against the district. Um, an effort was made to not have anyone on the LEAP or DEEP panel that had any involvement with either one of those lawsuits. And that frankly took some time to sort through. Uh, some people ended up being drawn at random that were gonna serve on those panels. And they were subsequently disqualified as a result of knowledge of that, those litigations. And so efforts were made to find other people and that simply took a significant amount of time. Uh, so that's the explanation there. As for the suggestion that a number of documents that should have been completed before this process started weren't completed, I would encourage you to take a look, um, first of all, to see whether that would apply to an interim evaluation. I'm not sure that it would, uh, again, when we use the interim versus the full blown, but secondarily, you're talking about there about items that Dr. Johnson was primarily responsible for completing. And I hope that we're not suggesting that by her, she making the decision or going through the process of not completing certain items that she then gets the benefit of those having not been completed when she wants to object to her evaluation. Uh, to the extent that's the suggestion, I would encourage you to reject that suggestion. And so finally, let me turn to this, this notion that there are items, there are negative items in the evaluation that are somehow unsupported because Principal Kimbrough didn't know enough or didn't observe enough to, uh, to ultimately put them in the evaluation. Well, I, I take great issue with that and so does the district. Uh, this was a, a very rough year for Dr. Johnson. There's no getting around that. Uh, she was reprimanded twice. Uh, at the suggestion and encouragement of Principal Kimbrough, uh, reprimanded by Dr. Polio twice. Uh, and then ultimately at the end of the year, she was reassigned as a result of many things that went on during that year that Principal Kimbo was, was, Kimbrough was well aware of that reflected and cast Dr. Johnson in a negative light and indicated that she was not doing the job that she had been hired to do. Uh, those problems were, were pervasive there were problems with parents, there were problems with students, and there were problems with other staff. And there were multiple problems on all of those fronts. Uh, those items are documented in Exhibit D to our submission. Uh, we submitted a series of E2 forms. Uh, E2 is the form that we use here in Jefferson County to document meetings between supervisors and those that they supervise. Uh, and on those forms, you end up with details about uh, difficult items that are discussed uh, and ultimately recommendations for discipline. As, in, and as I mentioned here, we had two separate recommendations for reprimand of Dr. Johnson that were accepted over the course of the year. Uh, in connection with that, um, one of the E2s mentions uh, a letter that was received from uh, a mental health practitioner that was at Dr. Johnson's school. Dr. Johnson's school was Maupin Elementary. Um, the mental health practitioner that was there um, submitted her resignation, or actually she left to take another position. Uh, and in doing so, she authored a letter to Principal Kimbrough. And I wanna read to you briefly from that letter, because again, I think it's, it, it speaks to the suggestion that Principal Kimbrough did not have sufficient uh, evidence or observation to say negative items about Dr. Johnson. And again, this is, I'm reading a paragraph from a letter that was sent to Dr. Kimbrough about Dr. Johnson by the former mental health practitioner at Malpin who worked closely with Dr. Johnson. Uh, second paragraph of that letter reads as follows, and it's at exhibit D to our brief. 
Unfortunately, in less than 30 days, I felt I had no other option but to seek alternate employment within JCPS. Please be advised my experience working with Dr. Kimberly Johnson was not only frustrating, but most stressful. In my 14 years of working with JCPS, I have never met a person such as Dr. Johnson. I find her to be toxic for the climate and culture in a workplace setting, as well as with students. It is my opinion Dr. Johnson is manipulative, deceitful, and extremely unprofessional. Now, again, that was a letter received by Principal Kimbrough. She also dealt with numerous other issues relating to Dr. Johnson over the course of the year. Uh, those are documented in the E-2s that were submitted with our brief, as well as the reprimands that she received and the demotion that she ultimately took. And I would submit that there is more than ample evidence on this record for the few negative comments that Principal Kimbrough elected to put in Dr. Johnson's uh, evaluation and that any issue relating to the professional growth plan that was mentioned was alleviated by the LEAP's decision to remove reference to that. Uh, that was done below and taken care of below and we have no issue with, uh, with, that, uh, with, with that alteration. And with that said, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you all very much for your attention. <clears throat> all right, now, uh, if there are any of the seat members that have questions, this would be, you can ask questions. Does this be time for her rebuttal? Her oh, does she? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Ms. Shrewberry, you have three minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you. I don't know how I'm going to fit it all in three minutes, but I'll do my best. So as addressed by Mr. Gorman, we've already discussed that we understand and consent to the jurisdiction of the SEEP panel. We understand that SEEP is here to address any issues that were brought up to the DEEP, which as Mr. Gorman referred to, can also be known as the LEAP at the earlier stages of appeal. Dr. Johnson at that stage appealed her interim summative evaluation in its entirety and all of the information submitted to you for review will show that she did in fact address in one way or another every issue that we've brought before you in our brief today. Um, the next thing I would like to address is really what this is about is not a letter that Dr. Kimbrough received castrating Dr. Johnson's character early on in the 2019-2020 school year. This is about building blocks and process. We have regulations, we have statutes, we have codes, we have regulations, we have policies and we have procedures and they exist for a reason to be followed. If the district, specifically in this case, Jefferson County, did not and or failed to follow those processes, policies, and procedures as dictated by code regulation adopted by the state, then unfortunately, their argument simply fails. If you are missing a block from a tower at the bottom, it falls down. The PGP is part of that building block. It is part of the foundation that's required for an evaluation to be successful at the end of the year. It is the basis of measurement that a counselor or a teacher or an assistant principal has to know whether or not they have succeeded in reaching goals set forth by the same policies and procedures already mentioned and by each school's independent needs by the end of the year. Mr. Gorman focused a lot on what he believed Dr. Johnson's motives to be, actual animus toward the district, that she has lawsuits against the district, that her and Kimbrough don't get along. That's not what this is about. This is about whether or not the district followed its own rules, whether the district followed the state's rules. And it's as simple as that. We've laid it out for you. They haven't. And as a result of not following 
the policies and procedures set forth in the JCPS CPEP. Her evaluation simply cannot stand. Those narratives that Mr. Gorman focused on, albeit whether they are negative or not negative, they have to disappear because they aren't based on any foundation as required. He made a comment about not completing items, if that's the suggestion that Dr. Johnson didn't complete items on her own, and I believe he was referring to the self-reflection mentioned earlier, that's not an on your own. Yes, Dr. Johnson's required to participate in that, but at the beginning of the school year, this is when you get your ducks in a row according to this policy. A principal comes through the door as the supervisor of her unit, as the operations management of that school, and says, you, 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 school counselor, teacher, assistant principal, let's get together. We're going to come up with this PGP. We're going to come up with self-reflection. We're going to reach, you know, set goals. You're going to know expectations. And so you. Sorry, my microphone seemed to mute itself. Uh, in conclusion, or you muted me because I'm out of time. So in conclusion, I disagree with the basis presented by the district for those reasons. Encourage you to read the briefs in their entirety. And thank you for your time this afternoon. All right, now uh, our members of this panel can ask questions. So this, this is Lee Todd. Since this was an interim evaluation, had this process not taken the path that it's now taking, was there a chance to have a full evaluation done uh, at a later time? To uh, this is Marilyn Shrewsbury. To our knowledge, sir, no, there was no opportunity for an actual summative year end evaluation as Dr. Johnson, as Mr. Gorman so poignantly um, presented to the panel. On the day Dr. Johnson was presented with this interim summative evaluation, she was also presented with a letter of demotion. So there would have been no other opportunity to have a com complete year end evaluation. I, I would only add that that would be true as to uh, service as um, a counselor. And I guess we should have been clear that that's what we're talking about. Dr. Johnson was the counselor at Maupin Elementary. Uh, she was um, removed from that position by Dr. Polio at the end of uh, the just, just closed school year. Um, so the issue would be not, she, there would not be an opportunity to evaluate her additionally in uh, the future as a school counselor at this point. Uh, certainly her efforts as uh, a teacher in her new position could be evaluated uh, in detail uh, going forward. Were PGPs um, developed by the other teachers and faculty at that school? Uh, I'll, to, to my knowledge, the answer is yes. And I also want to be clear that there was a PGP adopted and developed for Dr. Johnson. Uh, it was simply completed a, slightly beyond the deadline. Uh, th there's one that exists, uh, but its removal was based on it being slightly overdue, not that it didn't exist, it did exist. explain for me what the PGP was contained, what it contained? Was it a list of potential accomplishments or I'm not familiar with those? Yes, I, it was basically a collection of uh, targets for um, Dr. Johnson as a counselor to meet uh, re relating to uh, numbers of counseling sessions, uh, efforts with various different grade levels to cover different topics with them uh, and that sort of thing. Basically, um, a, a roadmap, if you will, to uh, what she would spend much of her time doing over the course of the year as a counselor. Okay. 
And we would just disagree with that. I'm not sure um, if it was attached to your uh, brief, Tyson, but I believe somewhere in the underlying record is the PGP. Feel free to look at it, but we found it to be fully inadequate and lacking in any real uh, set of standards. Um, it, it failed to show any actual measurement for growth uh, while it addressed a few of the things Mr. Gorman just discussed as a number of counseling sessions, but not day-to-day -day job duties, roles, and or responsibilities, or any real um, avenue to measure growth throughout the year. It was very much uh, thrown together and not well. And outside, of course, the time frame allotted. In the purview of the committee to drop that from the evaluation, I read the truth. Dr. Todd, could you ask that again? I didn't catch all that. Procedurally, it was uh, allowed for the committee to drop the PGP from the evaluation. Yes. Yes. And they did. Yes, there is provision for um, in the in the charge to the local evaluation uh, appeals panel. They have uh, somewhat broad discretion to um, uh, amend, if you will, uh, evaluations, and that's what they did in this instance. They uh, they they amended it um, actually through some sort of snafu. We we actually only submitted the uh, the amended version of the evaluation yesterday. Uh, I, I noticed in preparing for today that neither party, for whatever reason, had submitted the amended version. But uh, essentially, the the, uh, the the evaluation went from uh, spilling on to three pages barely to about two and a half pages. A, a, a short portion of it relating to the growth plan was removed by uh, the uh, the deep, uh, and that is within their purview. Uh, certainly, they have on other occasions made slight adjustments and modifications to evaluations. That's that's part of their charge to do that. <clears throat> So in, in my experience with PGPs, the teacher actually writes it with, you know, support from administration. So is is it different in your district? Like that somebody else writes it for a teacher? I, from my perspective, the answer is no. It, it's primarily a, a, a document that is authored by the person uh, involved, be it a teacher or a counselor. And then ultimately there is input from their supervisor, in this case, Principal Kimbrough, uh, before a final document is signed off on. But, uh, but yes, my, my understanding and belief, and, and I'm unaware of it being different in this instance, is that uh, it is the, the individual who is, who is being evaluated. It's their duty to certainly author the first draft of the professional growth plan. And, and to second that, that's, 100% true. It is a team effort. It is the, in this case, it would have been Dr. Johnson as a counselor authoring a draft of a PGP, which she had done before as a counselor prior to that year, and then going to her supervisor, scheduling that meeting within that 30-day period allotted by the rules to have a discussion about what's included in this PGP. Uh, Dr. Kimbrough, or I'm sorry, rather Miss Kimbrough did not um, want to do that. And then when they did finally meet outside the prescribed time frame, she had a lot of input um, and not not helpful input. And she got the product that she wanted. So that's you know part and parcel why we're here today. Other questions? So tell me one more time, like why 200 days? Well, uh, you got a couple of things. From our perspective, you've got a couple of things going on there. Uh, obviously, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we also have the summer recess uh, to contend with. Uh, all of that would be, you know, 
common to anyone. Uh, and then specifically to Dr. Johnson, uh, as I mentioned, she had a lawsuit against the district that was settled uh, a couple of years ago, and then now she has a current, a different lawsuit against the district. Uh, a decision was made, and I think on some level supported by Dr. Johnson, that um, the uh, folks involved with her evaluation panel, uh, they were looking for people with the appropriate qualifications to serve on that panel who had no involvement with her current or former lawsuit. Uh, and that simply took some time to find uh, people that, uh, that fit that bill. And so that's, uh, that's why we ended up with, uh, with what was unfortunately a substantial delay. So just to add to that, in our brief, it's very um, detailed, outlined. She appealed on May 22nd. On May 26th, the JCPS superintendent-designee uh, confirmed receipt. It wasn't until October 22nd, Dr. Johnson herself emailed. It's the only communication between May 26th and October 27th was October 22nd when Dr. Johnson emailed the designee asking about the status of her appeal. Then on the 27th, five days later, the designee says that there's an individual, Ms. Rashonda Johnson, who was supposed to be on the deep panel, but that um, Dr. Johnson worked in one of the schools she supported. And as a result, Kim Morales would represent the district in the appeals panel it was upon hearing that information that Dr. Johnson responded that Ms. Morales was a subject witness in the 2017 action mentioned by Mr. Gorman that Dr. Johnson successfully brought against the district. And then it was about a month later that Dr. Johnson was contacted and told they wouldn't even be reviewing it until December 15th. So she followed up. Um, and did what she was supposed to do. So if there was a problem with somebody sitting on that panel, I mean, pandemic aside, we all understand it's a real consideration. It could have come to her attention before October 27th of 2020 and without her having to prompt that discussion. Well, uh, one other issue to, to point out on that particular item, though, if you go and look at her submission to uh, the LEAP DEEP, uh, which is Exhibit B to our brief in this uh, proceeding. It's what she submitted. Uh, she submitted 20 some odd pages of material. I don't see anything indicating a protest of that particular time frame, that timing. Um, that delay, to my knowledge, was not a subject taken up by the leap or deep. Uh, I see no evidence of that anywhere that that particular delay, that aspect of this, was offered as an appeal point. Uh, that's something that has come about at this level only, uh, and we would argue as a result is not properly preserved. Well, I would say to that point that you can't appeal it until you get the decision. The decision didn't come until January, and this is the next level in the appeal. You can't appeal to the deep, the fact that it's taken the deep so long to get to doing the deep's job. It, it's not really no, part and parcel of their process. I would just disagree with you. Well, I would disagree with that. I mean, certainly if you feel like uh, it's taken too long to get before a panel, I would think you would mention that to the panel. Uh, that That's that's my point. And it was not mentioned to the panel and it's not part of the submission. Any other questions? Madam Chair, if I may ask a question just on behalf uh, uh, to clarify the matter regarding timelines. Um, it appears, based on the documents that were submitted, that the LEAP rendered its decision on December 15th. Um, and the commissioner and state board received this appeal on January 18th. I think there was an issue between December 15th and January 8th about transmission of the decision. Um, but as I understand it, it was sent to uh, the Johnson's attorney on December 15th. So the parties just want to address that issue uh, briefly for the see if I think that would be helpful. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Did you say that it was it was submitted to me on December 15th? That's my understanding. So oh. 
that would be news to me that it was submitted on the 15th of December. I wasn't involved. I represent Miss Johnson in her civil litigation and have represented her in other district matters, but did not participate in her uh, deep appeal process. She submitted those uh, appeals um, on her own, it, so to speak. So it's my understanding that it was sent to Dr. Johnson's wrong email address on the 15th of December and that she didn't receive it until January the 8th, I believe, of 2020. And if I received it in December of 2015, I have no independent recollection of that um, at all. And uh, th I think that was Mr. Allen that asked that question. I, I can't really comment on that, uh, Todd. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I do know there was an issue with um, the decision of the LEAP. Uh, the decision itself uh, somehow got lost in the shuffle and Dr. Johnson ended up getting the revised evaluation before she got the decision. And I don't really understand how that happened, but I do understand that that did happen. My understanding is that she had everything uh, sometime around the first or second week of January of 2021, uh, both in terms of a revised evaluation and the DEEP's decision, which is a, a, essentially a one-page document that directed the district, uh, directed personnel within the district to uh, author a new evaluation or see that a new evaluation was authored. It was authored and uh, it appears to, all of that appears to have gone out around the second week of January of 2021. So I have the timeline here. They made the decision on the 15th. On the 29th, the superintendent designee sent Dr. Johnson an email with the updated version of the summative evaluation but she had not received the decision as Tyson said. So she responded asking to be provided with a copy of the decision. And on January 8th, she received a copy of the decision. On January 15th, she um, asked the superintendent designee uh, again for information on how to appeal to SEEP and the 18th, she sent an email to Dr. Glass asking on information on how to appeal to seat. On the 19th, um, she got information from Mr. Todd Allen and then appealed the decision. And on the 8th, we got the letter scheduling this hearing. Thank you for the uh, well, I actually asked on the 20th. She, that's when I originally asked. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not an evidentiary hearing. We can't have Dr. Johnson offering uh, evidence. Sorry. No, no talking. <clears throat> uh, any more questions? All right, then we are going to go into closed session. So I think you will exit this meeting. Uh, except for uh, Sharon Robinson, she'll stay. Is that what we'll do, Todd? Yeah, first, we'll like to vote to go into the closed session. Okay. I'll make a motion to go into closed session. Some discussion. Hold on just a second. We have to state the specific reasons. Okay. I've got, that's, I've got to yeah, and uh, Todd, Todd, real quick before before we do that, I. When I've done these in the past, and it's been a while, the parties have stuck around until after the closed session to potentially answer more questions. Do, do you want us to do that or not? I'm I'm happy either way. I just raised that because that, that's back when we used to drive to Frankfurt. That's how we did it. At this time, discussion requires this panel to go into closed session under the Open Meetings Act, KRS 61810-1J, as allowed by and under the requirements of KRS 61.815 to deliberate Dr. Johnson's SEEB action number 202101. 
Do I have a motion to go into closed session for such purpose? So moved. Uh, I second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 We will now go into closed session. Parties, please exit the room at this time. We will call everyone back upon the resumption of the open session portion of this public meeting. All right. Having concluded our confidential closed session deliberation related to SEEP action number 2021-01 and being ready to return to open session, I need a motion to return to open session. Do I have a motion? I so move. Second. second. Thank you. Discussion? All right, let's vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We will now return to the open session portion of this public meeting. Having concluded our confidential closed session discussion under the Open Meetings Act KRS 61810-1J as allowed by and under the requirements of KRS 61815 to deliberate Dr. Johnson's SEEP action number 202101, we are now returning to the open session portion of this public meeting. The Open, open Meeting Act provides a public body from taking any action in the closed session of a public meeting. The seat did not take any action during its closed session discussion. At this time, I'll entertain a motion concerning appeal of seat action number 2021-01. I have a motion to affirm the LEAP decision. Do I have a second? I second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. So thank you for your presentations. A written decision will be issued by the SEEP in 15 working days. If there are no questions, the SEEP will now adjourn. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned.